Yeah, so uh, thank you everyone for staying the afternoon. Uh, and uh, so I'm with the Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology at the National Institute for Standard <coughs> National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And I'm a device person, not a, a processing person. So uh, in a way, what I'll be talking about to you is, is sort of devices uh, that are enabled by advanced fabrication. But um, I was lucky over the years to take advantage and, and sort of to know people who could help me with fabricating those things. So I'll start by sort of just uh, giving you my perspective on why MIMS, microelectric mechanical systems, are interesting. Uh, they kind of have three distinct advantages. Uh, straight miniaturization can shrink size, weight, power, and cost, and that allows uh, things like accelerometers and inertial sensors and your mobiles and cars and laptops and cameras uh, cheap. Um, the second important thing is uh, the ability to integrate uh, hundreds to millions of degrees of freedom into this one little small system. And the examples of that are, you know, that, that projector probably, or definitely movie projectors and cinemas uh, use MIMS technology, MIMS micro mirror displays to, to uh, project, uh, project movies on screens. And there are other things like adaptive optics and uh, telecommunication fiber optics, which is all take advantage of being able to cramp uh, many uh, devices into small areas. Uh, and the third one is certain types of transduction uh, become more efficient inherently uh, by uh, going smaller. So uh, the transductions that take advantage of coupling microscale motion or nanoscale motion to other signals. And one example is sort of the, the phonon-photon coupling that, that's been actively worked on, uh, you know, and Oscar Painter is one of the pioneers in this, this sort of field. Um, but uh, what we at NIST are interested in is things that are related to measurement tools and metrology and uh, your sort of quintessential MIMS measurement tool for nanoscale science is an atomic force microscope which takes basically various types of physics like uh, from sort of mechanics of the surface to uh, magnetic forces to, to electrical forces and couple them to uh, motion and that motion is then coupled to light and a light is being detected and, and converted to electrical signal. So that's, that's the, sort of the transduction chain to get uh, to measure that, that sort of nanoscale process that happens through coupling it to mechanical motion of some, uh, of some mechanical transducer. Um, these things are intrinsically enabled by advanced fabrication in two ways. Uh, one is by having unique processes that, that enable things, but also importantly, these unique processes have to be uh, we have to be able to integrate these processes into complex process sequences to actually build devices that work. Um, so my first example of this type of things is uh, somewhat old, but still I think it's very interesting work that I've uh, been part of at, at Bell Laboratories. The lead on this is Flavio Pardo, who was uh, instrumental actually building the, um, leading the team to build this device. I was part of sort of the team that, that designed it. Um, the challenge was to come up with a, an advanced uh, adaptive optic uh, slash imaging and targeting spatial light modulator for DARPA. What they wanted is a very large tip, tilt, and piston motion for each mirror, a large number of mirrors going very fast. And of course, they have to be optically smooth and, and, and highly controllable and have high fill factor. So, so this enables not just adaptive optics, but sort of being able to look that way and compensate for atmosphere and then look that way to compensate for atmosphere and, and do things like that. So um, they came up with a rather challenging set of specifications when they were translated by us into sort of, sort of the, the mechanical, the, the MEMS domain, right? Uh, these types of micromirrors are simultaneously fast, dense, and have to be built on sort of large scale with high degree of control. So what, what this graph shows is at the time, about 2000, 2005, sort of most of the devices, what, what you have on the um, horizontal scale is the density, the number of degrees of freedom, the number of actuators uh, per square millimeter. And uh, on what you have on the vertical scale here is the mechanical power uh, per degree of freedom, how, how strongly these actuators have to 
have to push this thing. And this power is really uh, um, very intimately related to how fast these things are because the, the mass and the moment of inertia of these devices is actually dictated by the optical properties. So if you want to just build it with the conventional mirrors, then you, know, you have silicon, you have gold, right, the reflective layers, right? You have to take an object and be able to tilt it and, and piston it. And how fast you can tilt and piston it depends on how much power, mechanical power, you can supply to it, right? So it becomes progressively more difficult once you have more things that have to push stronger. And basically, and the size of this blob is, is a product of how many mirrors you want and the bits per mirror in terms of the accuracy of control. Right? And, if, and blue things are two-dimensional arrays versus red things are one-dimensional arrays. So this was some collection of sort of the 2000, circus 2005 state-of-the-art things. And the goal was over there, so the, the typical DARPA thing. So how do we even think about that? Okay. So we needed to do something fairly radical and uh, we needed to basically pack a lot of electromechanical power into, into a small footprint. And then one of the best ways to do this um, with high density is, is comm drives, but these comm drives have to be uh, basically be able to produce enough power to, to move this large object in various types of ways. So, so what you see here is that the basic element of this device is essentially what, what we call a comm drive, which is, has a stationary set of fingers <laughs> and has a plates and has a moving set of plates and when the voltage is applied between the two uh, the moving set of plates are, are pivoting rotating around the axis here and you can kind of see that they're getting sucked into the toward the stationary fingers by electrostatic attraction uh, so then the this top layer the arm spring layer is actually transducing this sort of motion it, it both constrains the motion of the comb drives uh, to to a tilt to, to, to a tor torsional motion, and then it transduces it into a motion of a mirror. And we actuate, if we actuate all of them together, it results in a piston. If we instead actuate two of them, uh, it results in a tilt. So we can basically produce, this device can produce arbitrary tilts and, and piston motions at the same time by applying the, the proper voltages to these things. So that was kind of our design approach, of course. Um, in order to kind of be able to really do this um, in, in arbitrary, form and fast enough at reasonable voltages, we really, really pushed, uh, challenged the fabrication process for this thing in, in sort of two ways. Um, so we have, you know, your conventional, you need a routing layer. In fact, you sort of need a, a be able to connect this dense thing to, to something uh, to the other side of the chip. Uh, but for at least the, for the test purposes, we needed a routing layer. We needed a set of stationary comm drives and uh, moving comm drives that were dense in the plane, right? So, so the, um, the comm drive layer has to be both thick to be able to produce enough power and it has to be, uh, it has to be thin uh, in, in the plane so we have sort of a, a fairly challenging CD. So at the time that, that etch uh, wasn't a trivial thing to do. Uh, I don't think it's, it's an entirely trivial thing to do now either. Um, then you need to basically be able to build the rest of it on top and uh, align everything accurately, right? So, so you need to put a sacrificial uh, layer on top of this. You need to grow more polysilicon, which again, we were able to do. Uh, this layer is also not a trivial layer because it has to be thicker than, I mean, it has to have these springs that have to have, to have a high aspect ratio. The reason is you want a torsional spring and not just something that just allows a, a vertical up and down motion. Uh, so, so again, the design sort of challenged us. And then you, on top of that, you need to basically create a, a light and flat mirror. Um, sacrificial layers that have to be removed, and they were basically silicon dioxide layers uh, in all cases. So there's this pretty thick sort of set of layers that have to be accurately registered between, between each other. And that's that's been built, and it actually worked amazingly. I mean, I'm still amazed about that they, they were able to do this. And it's easy for me to like sit in the computer and design this thing. You know, how do you fabricate this? Okay, so, so what you see is this, that the stationary comm drives are here. There's the moving comm drives that are hidden under this, this sort of spring layer. Um, this is an actual SEM, colorized SEM of an array. You can see the yellows are mirror. Ye yellow, yellow are mirrors. There are some mirrors that have been just, just ripped off and you can kind of see the actuators underneath it. 
Uh, this is the flip side of the mirror that shows the sort of a reinforcement strut to keep it flat. And this just, the next few slides is just going to show you that, yeah, in fact, it worked as designed uh, because it was fabricated as designed and we were being, being able to achieve sort of large displacements on the orders of a few microns and, and, and large, large angles. Uh, my angles axis is wrong. Yeah actually non-existent, but I think those numbers actually basically apply to the angle axis as well in, in degrees. So that's, that's about five, five degree point there. Uh, so you can see these are actual uh, white light uh, profiler data showing uh, four meters actuated at two different tilt directions in the piston. Um, this shows the dynamics of it. In fact, we've, we have achieved sort of the, the goals of being able to make these transitions in times of order of 10 microseconds or so. So we've kind of completely switched this, this in, in about 10 microseconds. This is slowed down, uh, stroboscopic interferometry slowed down by 6,000 times or so. so. So in fact, this was, was able, we were able to do this. And, and kind of the take home message, I, I, you know, this was, was, uh, was a fabrication tool de force that really enabled this type of functionality. And you know, the, oops. Yeah, so, so this, the, our test device was kind of here at the end. Um, and um, yeah, but I mean, th this was, was kind of beyond the state of the art at the time. So now I'm going to switch to a couple of other examples. And the first one was really the integration and sort of the complexity demonstration. The, uh, the other two examples are more on the transducers and sort of coming to NIST. Uh, I'm more interested in sort of measurement science and, and uh, using micromechanical transduction. So the typical sort of measurement principles on many of these types of things is, is you have a nanoscale physical system that is coupled to a micro and mechanical device and that motion of that device is measured then to, to capture something about the physical system of interest. So where does this work well? It works well typically for low dimensional small systems. You know, you can't have a local interaction in the AFM or, or a, you know, uh, individual magnetic flux lines coming in and out of the superconductor or some such thing where there's kind of an intrinsically low dimensional system uh, that is uh, matched well to a small uh, micromechanical transducer. Um, the other place where it, it sort of this works well is where the geometrical confinement actually enhances interactions such as, again, sort of photon, phonon interactions and things of that nature. Um, in all cases, you need uh, prescription, uh, pr precision motion readout for these types of transducers, and, and uh, local optomechanical interaction is something that, that, that provides a good avenue for sensing that motion and taking it, taking it out and capturing it. So um, we have two active programs kind of looking at two different aspects of it. You know, one is uh, using integrated dielectric cavity optomechanical systems to make transducers for uh, AFM and for, for other reason and, and for other applications. And again, this takes advantage of, of some of the, the work that, that was done by Oscar Painter and, and others. And uh, it, basically what we do is we built in a, an optical cavity that's uh, coupled to a, this nanomechanical probe. So the, this, this narrow probe is what's really moving. This tip is what's interacting with a sample. So that's your sharp tip of an AFM. And uh, this works as a non-chip interferometer that's read out by this waveguide. What we add to, the, uh, to this field is the whole concept of sort of integration and packaging where we can build something that's compact, fiber characterized, connectorized, practical. We can stick it in an actual atomic force microscope and yet don't degrade the readout performance where this can be um, uh, sort of, sort of ha has this uh, very high sensitivity at, at uh, high bandwidth. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a, a picture of, of a typical transducer that we build. And of course, you know, in, in addition to basically building the cavity, building the, the micro, uh, the nano beam, building the, the photonic, circuitry on this, we need to be able to overhang this over the, the edge of the chip where, and we can need to sharpen it, sort of have a sharp tip to interact with the sample, and we need to connect this to fibers, and, and this is uh, 
incidentally, we take one of these types of devices and stick it in a commercial cipher AFM, and, um, and it works. This, this gives you sort of the idea that we can basically do a, a, an extremely fast scan uh, with very high resolution because our probes nanoscale, we basically shrunk the size of our AFM cantilever by, by orders of magnitude. Uh, what we can do is we can increase the speed and, and also it lowers the noise because it lowers the interaction of that probe with, with the environment. So um, the rest of the talk is about using plasmonics to go kind of a step beyond this in uh, terms of achieving very localized optomechanical transduction. So plasmonics is, is, is a great way to uh, concentrate energy at optical frequencies in very small spaces in terms of both field enhancement that we've heard uh, already uh, here before and then also in terms of confinement. Um, interestingly, uh, sort of plasmonic structures are sensitive because they, the field is so concentrated. Their resonances are sensitive to things that, that, that are nearby, like certain dielectric surfaces. So they can be used for pro as probes, uh, in, including things like scanning probes, right? So intrinsically, because they're sensitive to this, they're sensitive to the gap, right? So the plasmonics, because they concentrate these fields, they're sensitive to to changes in the geometry much more so than um, many dielectric devices that cannot concentrate light into volumes that's less than a wavelength cube. Um, we particularly rely, we particularly like using uh, metal insulated metal waveguide geometries because in these geometries, between sort of two, in a gap between two metals, you can stick light in there. There's always a the fundamental mode doesn't have a cutoff. So you can, you ha you can, you could have a, a 10 nanometer gap or, or actually one nanometer gap, so Maxwell starts to break down below one nanometer gap. But, but you can have these gaps and you can stick light from um, near infrared down to thermal and it will propagate, right? It will propagate with a loss, but it will propagate, right? Uh, so fundamentally, we, you have this sort of electron charge density. So you have a lot of free carriers that can interact very strongly with light. Well, that's good. Uh, and this confinement is fundamentally enabled by the fact that you're substituting uh, electromechanical energy of the electrons so that they're inertia for magnetic field. So instead of electric field oscillating with magnetic field and coupled with magnetic field to create electromagnetic wave, you have electric field coupled with uh, electron energy density. And uh, because they're mass, uh, this thing basically allows you to concentrate energy into, into volumes that, that you can't concentrate otherwise at these frequencies. Uh, another intriguing thing is that we've found that there's a favorable interaction between, um, the favorable scaling between interaction and loss. So if you can sh shrink this device, your interaction increases and it actually increases faster or slightly faster than the loss increase. So you can shrink these things and not lose in terms of uh, your, your sort of signal strength. Okay. So now we localize this in three dimensions by basically taking the top metal surface, its top metal layer, and patterning it. So you can pattern it into this uh, type of, uh, you know, few, a few hundred nanometer, um, on its few hundred nanometer scale, and that creates a, a gap plasma standing wave that's, that's completely trapped between these two, two, two gold uh, metals in this case. Um, we, Changing the mode order, like how many waves is in this resonance, affects uh, the radiation coupling, and therefore it affects Q and uh, the strength of the modulation, how well you can couple in light in and out from, uh, from free space into these things. And of course, if you go down to sort of gaps at the, at the scale of 10 nanometers or so, uh, the resonance frequency of this standing wave is going to be a strong function of, of small changes in the gap. So you can actually use this 
uh, this resonance to, to sort of detect very small changes in the gap. And that's the basis of the optomechanical transduction with these plasmonic devices. So what can we do next? Well, we can basically build this thing and embed this top prism into a, some kind of nanomechanical structure like a cantilever shown here. So then the cantilever sort of moves up and down, the gap gets modulated, and, and you can, the resonance is, is going to get modulated, and um, you, can, you can use this to measure it. On top of that, of course, you know, we, being MEMS people, right, let's build more interesting things. Let's put a metal layer on top of it, and it's going to do two things, right? One is we can apply voltage between this, this top metal layer on top of the cantilever and the substrate, and we can move this electrostatically, right? So we can excite mechanical motion. We can just DC tune the gap. Uh, in addition, if the temperature changes, depending on the shape of this, of this metal and its thickness, uh, you're going to have a bimorph, right? So if the temperature changes, the, the shape of this whole cantilever changes. So we can couple thermal modes in the system with uh, mechanical modes in the system. And in fact, by shaping that uh, layer, we can control which modes are coupled to what. All right. So how do we go about building this? Well, what we do is we take basically uh, a gold pad and the sacrificial layer. We use chrome as a sacrificial layer. So there's two key processing features in this. You know, one is the use of, use of chromium as a sacrificial layer for creating these, these extremely small gaps. And the, the, this relies on the fact that a chromium etch is actually very benign to, toward pretty much everything else. So it's not going to touch your nitride even. Your nitride is low quality. And, and it's not going to touch anything else, right? So you can just sort of dunk it and etch it and like supercritical release. You're done. Uh, the, we use PCVD silicon nitride deposited at low temperature. It's not the world's greatest material, but it's sufficiently mechanically robust, and um, it is compatible with gold. So we can deposit it on top of gold, embedding this prism. And so what, what do we go about doing this is we basically you know, pattern this with an E-beam and uh, either lift off or uh, actually uh, lately we've been uh, sputtering these, these layers and we've been patterning them with argon ion milling uh, with, through the uh, electron beam uh, defined resist mask. Uh, we, can, we then deposit and pattern the cuboid on top of this separately. Again, sort of this is E-beam lithography. All of it's E-beam lithography at this point. Uh, then we build the nitride layer and build the actuator layer on top, um, pattern the actuator layer, uh, pattern the nitride, well, actually pattern the actuator layer, deposit the, the thick metal leads, um, pattern that by lift off, and uh, pattern the nitride at the end. So using, using the, um, some of the actuator layer as a, as a hard mask. So again, the idea is sort of to, to separately patterning, by separately patterning all these layers, we have basically the freedom within this platform to couple various optical, mechanical, thermal, and electrical degrees of freedom um, in, in, in various ways that we're sort of beginning to explore at this point. That just shows you some of the uh, elect uh, electron micrographs of the device. And in this case, this is the, uh, the prism footprints, about 35 nanometer thick gold prism sitting. This is the, cr the fib cross-section through this. This is collapsed, by the way. There's almost no gap. Um, there's gold. Um, on top of this sort of bottom gold layer that's hidden under that. Uh, these are the typical dimensions. This, the dimension, this device is smaller. This is about, this is the first order device. So it's about the sort of half of that to a third of that, of that size. So again, we can build a variety of these things and, and, and study them. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. So this is one of the, uh, one of the optical micrographs of a cantilever with the blue is the electrode, the, the chrome gold electro, thin electrode layer on top of the nitride cantilever. And there's a window in the, in the metal so that that's just covered by nitride. And under the nitride, you can see that dots. That's the, the, plasmonic, the plasmonic resonator. OK, so, so what can we do with this? Uh, when the gap changes, the spectrum, this is a calculation, uh, the spectrum of this, of absorption of this plasmonic resonator changes. So if we shine light on it through a, a reasonably high NA optical microscope, we see this uh, absorption spectrum that's, that, that produces a high 
for an plasmonic scale that <laughs> 23 turns out to be kind of a high key resonance that's limited by uh, intrinsic losses and it's not, it's undercoupled to radiation as opposed to many of the typical plasmonic antennas which have Qs of 10 which are, are sort of radiation limited. And of course, you know, as we move this thing, uh, the resonance shifts and, and we get modulation in, in the reflected light. Uh, the cantilever is thermally excited at room temperature and uh, this uh, shows, I mean, we have basically a small gap of order of 15 nanometers in this case. And this is a calculation of uh, the shift of the resonance, the optomechanical coupling, which is the shift of the resonance per nanometer of motion. And uh, sort of these two terahertz per nanometer is, is the largest number I've sort of known pretty much across the uh, sort of all devices that I know about. Um, this shows that we can measure mechanical motion. This is the di displacement noise. This is the thermal thermally driven cantilever displacement, right? So sort of, you think about it, sort of Brownian motion of the cantilever. And this is our noise level here. And that noise level consists of basically uh, a uh, short noise calculated and a detector dark noise. So we're short noise limited in this case. And uh, the sensitivity to vertical motion of this cantilever is 40 times better than, than uh, other plasmonic device force, about four times better than you can do with a Doppler vibrometer, but the Doppler vibrometer uses a wavelength size, sort of, well, actually multiple wavelength size. It doesn't use a, a high MA objective. Uh, it uses a large beam. So, so in fact, our measurement footprint, the area from which we measure mechanical motion is 150 times smaller than the corresponding diffraction limit at the numerical aperture that we, are, we were using for this measurement, right? So we basically transduce motion from a, a very local thing better than, than your, your Doppler vibrometer would transduce motion off of a much larger thing at the same optical power and, you know, fundamentally short noise limited. So another thing that's interesting about this, we can apply voltage to it, right? And with a couple of volts, we can basically move this resonance by more than a slight line width, right? The fact, the, the two, two combined facts that we, we actually have this modulation to be fairly large, this is about sort of 40% modulation here um, from a single antenna, right? So this is just light reflected off of the single antenna. It gets modulated by about 40% depending on your, whether you're on resonance or off resonance. And the fact that we can actually tune it by, by a whole resonance says that this has potential for uh, use as a uh, spatialite modulator type device, right? So you can actually modulate incident light and reflected light off this device both, both strongly and um, because, because you can tune a lot and, and you have a potential to sort of strongly modulate the reflection uh, with just a few volts, right? So this, we, we are kind of looking into, okay, so I, I showed you this first work on spatialized modulators using micromirrors. Can this be used to accomplish similar type of function with a metamaterial like uh, spatialized modulator approach? Certainly we can excite various mechanical modes of this device, these devices and see them uh, using the plasmonic couple, plasmonically coupled measurement. Um, What's interesting here is the fact that by placing these antennas, these, these resonators at different places on the same type of cantilever, we see a different, I mean, the, the two mode frequencies are the same for both cantilevers. But when you shift the antenna, what you do is you kind of enhance the transduction of the, uh, the fundamental mode and you decrease the trans transduction of the higher order mode, the second, second order mode, by placing it further away. Right? By, you know, by placing it closer to the base here, and in, in fact, sort of decrease the transduction of the fundamental and increase the transduction of the, of the, uh, the first order. Uh, so you can, the optomechanical coupling measurement is so local, you can actually distinguish different mechanical modes on these, on these sort of few micron, a couple micron cantilevers. Okay, yeah, let's go. Uh, we can shine light and make this resonate by itself, right, by just shining DC light. And we can actually make it uh, both uh, cool and, and, and resonate. Uh, this is typical uh, thermally driven 
optomechanical self oscillation. But what's interesting here is the fact that we are, this is driven by like a single plasmonic antenna. So you, you can shine DC, like you see CW light on it, it starts ringing, and that's great. But then you can excite it with a weak electrostatic tone. So we excite it with a weak, weak periodic force and look at how it responds, right? And if, you, if the frequency of that, and what, 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 what's shown here is this is the response spectrum and this is the, um, the frequency of the force, right? So that line here is the frequency of the excitation. This bright line is this thing vibrating at its fundamental frequency. Um, what happens is when these things become close to each other, it, this jumps on it, it gets, it, it locks, right? It, it, it's injection locking. Um, and then once it's injection locked, it's a pure harmonic vibration at the frequency of the uh, stimulus. But at the amplitude of this original phonon laser amplitude, right? So we've just in, increased the response to this weak force by, by a whole lot. And we can use this potentially to track small unknown uh, stimulus frequency uh, better than, than, uh, than you can do in this sort of a simple linear system. And of course, this sort of fits your usual injection walking theory. All right, just to kind of summarize this, uh, we have a scalable architecture for plasma mechanics uh, with very small, enabled by the very small plasmonic features, um, offering exceptional optomechanical coupling, um, very sensitive to mechanical motion over small footprint, um, possible, possibility for fast optomechanical modulation frequency, uh, pixels for space flight modulators. Uh, we can drive this into a, 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 a phonon laser uh, type mode where it self oscillates. Um, we can engineer modes in their couplings uh, in the systems by changing its geometry and it could be used for, uh, for interesting types of new transduction mechanisms. So just to show you, uh, the plasmonics work's been done by Brian Roxworthy and, and Brian Dennis, photonics. Uh, been done by these guys, uh, most lately Sungmin and, and Thomas Michaels. Uh, we are uh, closely co collaborating with a group of Kartik Srinivasan at the same nano center as, as us, and uh, that's where I work. And we're always seeking collaboration opportunities, and postdoc positions are available if you're interested. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>but I think there's a lot of potential in sort of combining the different degrees, like in combining mechanical degrees of freedom with, with various things and sort of showing what tuning can do. And, and now that, that was the new thing for me to see that you've got a very sensitive measure of, of narrow gaps you, using a plasmonic effect. That was yeah, but the trick there was to kind of create the gap in the first place. Yeah, so how um, how much of a challenge was the processing? Uh, dare I ask about a yield, or you got one once and rejoiced? Uh, no, we can repeatedly do this. Uh, it took us a while to figure out what the sacrificial layer would be because things like uh, low temperature deposited silicon dioxide, then you kind of dunk it in either BOE or HF and the nitride Kills wasn't, up and wasn't dies. coping with that no. well. Um, you know, there, there were other things like we're sort of trying to figure out instead of the nitride where we're going to do ALD or something or other, you know, higher, higher. There, there was, was kind of a big search space in terms of process integration. Yeah. But once Brian Brooks where they figured, you know, Chrome. the Chrome had worked basically. Excellent. Questions from folks here? You, you've, you've knocked them out. <laughs> Managed to confuse everyone. 
sufficiently? No, I don't think so. I mean, there was a volume of, volume of uh, information there, but uh, yeah, I appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you.